Okay, guys, welcome. We are covering a big old topic today, and that is the Crusades. Um, we're coming to our last couple of topics for uh, history, and uh, uh, we're going to cover this really controversial event, one that you're going to be, you know, if you're a Catholic, you're going to have this Crusades thrown in your face all the time. You know, about the, the brutality of it and, and all the, these things, trying to make Christians and Catholics look bad in this event. But I am going to try in this um, one to explode some myths, the very common myths about the Crusades that you'll often be um, uh, have thrown at you. Um, we're going to try to clarify some of those today. Now, I'm going to start with a review. We're going to go back to the Roman Empire. And I'm going to start a review using maps primarily just to show you how we got to the point where the Crusades happened, all right? And I know I'm going way back in time, but you'll hopefully you'll see the connection as I go through the slides, all right? Because the Crusades are a complicated event in history, and it's not it's 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 too easy for many people to pigeonhole them. But let's go back in time, and you don't have to take heavy notes on on these sections. The review, I'll I'll tell you when the heavy notes should start. But do pay attention to this so you can see what we're going to get at later. All right, here it is. This is the Roman Empire in 450. You guys remember this? It was split into two halves. These were based on the reforms of Diocletian and Constantine. You'll remember the. You know, the uh, diocese and the provinces and all of these other elements, okay? Now, um, you can also see on the map how uh, in 450, this is just before the Western Empire fell, the Rome had already given up some of its kingdoms to uh, to the European barbarians. You'll see the the Franks way up there in the corner. You'll see the Slavic kingdom, the Visigothic kingdom, the Vandal kingdom, and the Burgundians. These were all Germanic tribes that were eating away, and the British had already separated themselves from Rome. The the, the Roman armies had already left Britain. So we're starting to see the development of the barbarian world here in this map. Now we come to the fall of Rome, and you see the barbarian world does indeed take on uh, its full its full extent here. Um, you'll notice the Western Empire is gone. There's a small little portion of it still attached to the Northern Balkans, but for the most part, we see the Germanic kingdoms um, now are the governors of Western Europe. All right. Um, and you can see the Franks there again in Northern Europe right here, the Franks who are going to meet with Clovis. This is um, three or so years before, uh, five or so years before Clovis uh, took power among the Franks. And you'll see the result of that in this next slide. Because voila, in 562, okay, we see a couple of things have changed really radically. All right. Um, we see that the Frankish kingdom is now the dominant kingdom of, of Northern Europe, okay? Uh, the, those other smaller barbarian tribal groups have kind of been diminished. Now, notice it's the Frankish kingdoms. That is because of the way the Merovingians, Clovis's dynasty, um, gave every son a portion of the kingdom. So that's why it's called the Frankish kingdoms and not the Frankish kingdom. Okay. Now you can also see in this map that Justinian, this is this is 562 at the end of Justinian's reign, and his crazy effort to reconquer the Western Empire, which he did, you know, conquer a substantial amount. But as we know, it drained, it drained the treasury of the Byzantine Empire. Now, bam, 650. Okay. We see what used to just be this, this Arab territory in the south has now become the Arab Caliphate. And we see something. This is the state of Islam. This is the development of Islam. And we see that already, right, already they're conquering Christian territories, formerly Christian territories like Palestine, Syria, and Egypt. And you'll also notice with the Byzantine Empire how short-lived Justinian's reconquest of the West actually was. It did not hold. So he's lost to the barbarians. The, the Byzantines have lost to the barbarians, and the Byzantines have lost a great deal of their territory to the newfound Islamic religion. 
So the Byzantine world is shrinking, the uh, Islamic world is growing, and the barbarians are reasserting themselves after the reconquest of the West. Now in 737, you'll notice a couple of things, right? Uh, the Umayyad Caliphate, this is when the Arab world, United Arab world, reaches its greatest height. It goes all the way from Spain, all the way to India, the Umayyad Caliphate. All right. You will notice, too, that we no longer have Frankish kingdoms because this is 737. Charles Martel drove the Muslims out of northern France uh, at the Battle of Tours in 732, and he united the um, Frankish kingdom again under the Carolingians, although they're not kings yet. That's coming up with Pepin. Uh, the short, who will become the first true Carolingian king. But Charles Martel has made it a united kingdom once more. All right, And you'll also see way up here in the north in the map the, the, the development of the Vikings. They're starting to come into play in this in this region. Okay, They're not invading Europe yet or not raiding Europe yet, but that's on the way. So this is the Umayyad Caliphate, and you'll see how Charles Martel has united the Frankish kingdom. Now we see uh, Charlemagne's kingdom and the Abbasid Empire. Look at the extent of Charlemagne's kingdom. You can see why he was um, called the Holy Roman Emperor. That is a vast territory that he conquered that included a large part of Italy. You'll notice the Abbasid Caliphate, which followed the Umayyads. The Umayyads um, had a greater unified um, uh, empire, the Abbasids, you'll notice something about the Muslim world. It's starting to fragment into smaller, um, into smaller kingdoms, okay? The Abbasid, the uh, Umayyad are still in control of Spain, and you'll see these different emirates all the way around, okay? But you also see the vast kingdom of Charlemagne. This is just before it was broken apart, and we'll see that in the next slide. So this is 830. The Charlemagne was already dead for 16 years. This is, this is the empire of Louis, um, the, the pious. Um, who uh, ruled, was the last ruler of the unified uh, empire that Charlemagne had created. All right, now we see the invasions, all right? This is, you'll see here these arrows. These are the Vikings coming to northern France. You'll notice this is 923. So Alfred the Great has already established control of southern England. You'll notice the Vikings still have a small part of northern um, England called the Danelaw. And you'll notice here, that the kingdom has been broken apart. This is the result of the Treaty of Verdun. So instead of one united kingdom, you have the kingdom of Germany, the kingdom of France, and then that middle territory. Um, and you'll notice the Byzantine Empire is getting even smaller, all right, in this one. And you'll see the Muslim invasions here and the Magyars invasions here. The Magyars went into Germany and France and uh, northern Italy, the Muslims went to southern, uh, northern Italy and southern France, and the Vikings went uh, to northern France and um, so many other areas. All right, so this is that period of the invasions. So what came of that? Well, we studied that, right? The U United um, Europe, except for France, of course, it was fragmented. But let's see what happened here, all right? Now we're on the eve of the Crusades. All right, it's 1092, three years before the First Crusade. And we'll notice that the Kingdom of France, the German Empire, the Kingdom of England, and now that the Vikings are um, Christians, they're all the Kingdom of Norway, the Kingdom of Sweden, they're no longer pagans, all right? So a lot has changed in Western Europe. It's a much more stable world. But I want to explode the first myth right? We're just on the verge of the Crusades. But here is that first myth. It says the Crusades were wars of unprovoked aggression against a peaceful Muslim world. Okay, no Crusade myth can be more easily dismissed than this one, all right? Um, first of all, the Muslim world was not peaceful. It, broke, it had broken up into several parts, um, the other reason it wasn't peaceful is it, uh, especially among the Seljuk Turks, you'll see them over here in this territory, they began to persecute Christian um, pilgrims, all right? So this was not a peaceful state, all right? They had conquered huge amounts of Christian territory, all right, over those, uh, those 300, 400 years, 
all right? Christian territory had been conquered, and it, they'd never responded. All right. But now that Western Europe is much more stable after they dealt with the various invasions, they're able to actually confront some of the Muslim incursions into Christian territory. You'll see here in northern Spain, um, Muslims are already being driven back by Christians, but that used to be a Christian state before the Muslims conquered it. All right. The Byzantines are losing vast amounts of territory. The Christians in the Eastern Empire are losing vast amounts of territories to the Muslims. Um, they lost a famous battle, the Battle of Manzikert in 1071. And that left Constantinople open to a real threat. Almost the fall of Christianity in the East could have followed. So um, Spain, like I said, was already under reconquest. So um, and like I said, the, the pilgrims had been uh, persecuted in, that, in, in, in the Holy Land. So this was not an unprovoked aggression. The Byzantine emperor called on the Pope to, to help him, to, get, to, to help reconquer and protect the Christian lands of the East. Christian pilgrims are being persecuted, all right, in the Holy Land. So this was not an unprovoked attack and it was not an attack on a peaceful Muslim world. Now, the First Crusade. What happened? Uh, in 1095, after, after trying to deal with these things in other ways, Pope Urban II traveled up to France, all right? And at the behest of the Byzantine emperor and Christians who wanted to go on pilgrimage safely, he called on the French nobility. Um, to use their knightly skills instead of fighting each other, which was very common among the vassals and knights of that age, instead of fighting among themselves, to regain the Holy Land, to focus their, their attentions, military attentions, on where Christ actually walked, um, to regain that to, as, as a safe passage for Christians. Now, notice why he says they're doing this. This is from the speech that he gave in France. He says, I want you to undertake this journey for the remission of your sins with the assurance of the imperishable glory of the kingdom of heaven. All right. He, this was a pilgrimage. This was a purifying act. This was an act of self-donation. You were giving your life um, for the, 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 those Christian pilgrims who no longer can enjoy access to the Holy Land. And so moving was his speech that the French knights and uh, nobles um, all shouted at various times, Deus vult, God wills it, at various times during the speech. Okay, and then this became what they did called taking the cross. They would, they would take the cross and become crusaders. And in 1096, the Crusaders began the incredible journey uh, eastward um, that had been, not been taken before. There were about 25 to 30,000, which was really a small force in many ways, but not what the Emperor Alexius expected. He did not expect a crowd that big. Um, and immediately there was friction between the Byzantine Emperor and the Crusaders. Um, and this, this friction happened all throughout the Crusades, as we'll see. Um, now, after a whole bunch of mishaps and regaining some territory for the Byzantine Empire, but then acting independently of the Byzantine Emperor, all right, the, 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 uh, the Crusaders took uh, the uh, uh, Jerusalem in 1099, which was their goal, the, the, the focal point where Christ walked, Right, and it was after a lengthy siege. Now, many Muslims were killed. We're going to talk about this in, in a moment. Many Muslims were killed in the taking of Jerusalem, but also many were ransomed and allowed to go free. And it's at this time that four Crusader states were established. You see them here. All right, the Principality of Antioch. All right, um, uh, the County of Tripoli and the County of Edessa. I think I put Antioch twice. I meant to put the County of Tripoli there. Um, and then the Kingdom of Jerusalem, which theoretically um, was the overlord of all the Crusader states. They were the rulers of the Crusader states. Now, let's talk about that first crusade. This is the second myth, all right, that the, the uh, taking of Jerusalem was emblematic. Um, of the cruelty of the Crusades. Now, when the and here's the myth: the, when the Crusaders captured Jerusalem in 1099, they massacred every man, woman, and child in the city until the streets ran ankle deep with blood. 
All right. So as I pointed out in the last slide, they did not massacre every man, woman, and child. Many of those men, women, and children were ransomed. Okay. And I'm not going to attempt to justify the killings of civilians, which did happen. Okay. That did happen. But the people who wrote about the, 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 the streets running ankle deep with blood, um, these were literary exaggerations. They're actually using imagery from the Old and the New Testament, okay? They're not, it's not meant to be taken literally. Like, it's impossible the streets could be filled with the blood up to your ankles. That's just a, a, an absolute impossibility, all right? Now, the other thing I would say, while I'm not defending this, it was common practice at that time in the, in the, in the world, in both Asia and Europe, that when a city was besieged and it did not come to terms with its besiegers, that pretty much they were left open to any attack that could happen. And the besiegers acted freely and killed many people. I'm not denying that, okay? But the reports vary greatly about how many people probably died in that attack. Like, for example, one report said that 100,000 people were killed. That's completely untrue because at the time Jerusalem the city probably only had 20 to 30,000 inhabitants. A more reasonable number, although um, still not you know a very good thing to, to think about where about 3,000 people were killed in the siege of Jerusalem. but hardly the, you know hardly uncommon in that age. And if I pointed out to you, I could point out to you several examples of Muslim atrocities, um, that could rival the taking of Jerusalem. It was just the nature of warfare at that age. The only thing I would do by bringing up the Muslim atrocities is to point out that war is a very brutal thing. All right. So that is the second myth. So one myth one, the Crusaders were not an unprovoked attack. And myth two, no, the streets did not run ankle deep in blood. All right. Now let's look at the second and third Crusades. Um, this is going to bring up another point. These were ultimately failures, all right? Every crusade after the Fourth Crusade was was not really successful, all right? Now, what brought about the, the Second Crusade, the, the, the fall of Odessa in 1144, um, the, one of the Crusader states? And so St. Bernard of Clermont, a great saint, called for the crusade to help regain that territory after a, a brutal fall of Edessa. But it failed ultimately, and the people returned home empty-handed and discouraged. Uh, then um, the, the crusaders, some of them, not many actually, stayed in the Holy Land to help maintain the uh, crusader states. But a great leader had arisen among the Muslims by the name of Saladin. And Saladin... Um, um, Saladin was able to defeat a crusader army on July 4th, 1187, overwhelming defeat, all right? And then within a few months after that defeat at the Battle of Hattin, the, um, the city of Jerusalem was taken, and it was never taken by a, a Christian army uh, in the Middle Ages after that. I, now, I say it was never taken by a Christian army. For a brief period of time, the Christians did uh, regain Jerusalem, but that was under the negotiation of a Christian king who didn't want to go and fight. So he was very wealthy and he had negotiated with some Muslims and he got Jerusalem back, but that was not considered a worthy effort because it didn't involve um, it didn't involve uh, the, the, the Christian armies coming into, uh, into Jerusalem. All right. Um, so uh, the Third Crusade was led by three great European monarchs, Richard the Lionhearted of England, of great legend, Philip Augustus of France, and Frederick Barbarossa of Germany. To cut it quick, Frederick drowned crossing a river uh, on his way to the crusade, and his troops went home. Philip did not get along with Richard the Lionhearted, and he took his troops home. Richard stayed, and he enjoyed great success against Saladin, but he could never take Jerusalem. That was something that he was unable to do. Um, now, this is a map of what the uh, looked like just before the Third Crusade. And you can see, if you look over here, guys, this is a very small conquest. This was not this massive military success. You see Antioch, Tripoli, and the kingdom of Jerusalem. Edessa had already fallen. All right. So the, the, the Christians, the Muslim world is still massive. It still goes from Spain all the way to India. So the Christian effort um, extended only so far as that small little slice of the Holy Land. All right. So I wanted to point that out. This was not some massive um, movement here. 
all right, that, that conquered a great deal of Muslim territory. It, in, fact, in fact, did not. So let's take a look at the myth, myth three, okay? Western Christians, Christians went on crusade because their greed led them to plunder Muslims in order to get rich. In other words, the only reason men of crusades, they, were, they, they spoke noble words, but they weren't noble. They were greedy and they wanted money. Um, and again, this is, a, this is completely false. And the evidence for this is rock solid, all right? Crusading was an incredibly expensive undertaking, okay? Most crusaders were forced to sell their land, to mortgage their land, to pay for these expeditions, all right? Um, and these were not areas of the Muslim world where you would get rich. If you went to the crusader world, you weren't going to, you weren't going to find extraordinary wealth. Now, I'm not saying that some crusaders did not become wealthy in this event and some merchants did not become wealthy in this event. Okay. But very few crusaders stayed behind after they conquered that territory, whatever territory they did and won the crusade, they would return home and very rarely were they able to recoup their expenses. And a lot of them went bankrupt. And the other thing was the casualty rate on the Crusades was incredibly high. Most Crusaders did not expect to survive their journeys when they left, and many of them didn't. Some of the numbers are, are, are very high with how many people died. So you ask yourself, why did they go? Well, they went to atone for their sins and to win salvation by doing good works in faraway lands. It was a pilgrimage. It was a pilgrimage to help save their souls. So beyond the penance, it was also considered an act of selfless love. Many scholars have pointed this out. This was an act of love. They were laying down your life for another. There's greater love is no man than to lay down his life for his friends. All of this comes through, and, 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 and the Crusaders knew the dangers they were undertaking, but they still went. So this image that Many people are going to give you when you get to other classes that, that, that talk about the Crusades that all oh, the Crusaders were greedy and they weren't sincere in their religious belief. That is just simply not true. The evidence of their charters, what they wrote, and uh, in their in the Crusades is evidence enough that that was not their main motivation, was not greed at all. All right, now we'll talk briefly about the the later Crusades, the Fourth Crusade. This crusade is odd, guys. It never reached the Holy Land, but it was very successful in its own bizarre way. This was led by the Venetians and the French. Uh, Pope Innocent III called the crusade, um, but at a couple of points along the journey, he actually excommunicated the crusaders um, because they weren't living up to their obligation to go to the Holy Land. Um, it's a long and complicated story, but they were they were helping out a, a young man who claimed to that his uh, father was thrown off the uh, imperial throne of Constantinople, and he was blinded and thrown in a dungeon, and that his uncle had taken over, and he wanted to be re-established. Uh, uh, he wanted to help uh, re-establish his father on the throne. And the Crusaders were very sympathetic with this story. They're all chivalric men, and they were like, this is disgraceful. You know, how could this guy get blinded and thrown in a dungeon? So they agreed uh, on their way to the Holy Land to stop in Constantinople and reestablish this guy on the throne. Um, so they did. They did stop in Constantinople, and they did reestablish this young monarch um, uh, and his father back on the throne of Constantinople. But this young man promised them huge amounts of money and troops if he, they helped him. And the truth of the matter was, there was not a huge amount of money or a huge amount of troops that were available to him. Um, and so the Crusaders waited outside of Constantinople. Um, and demanded that this guy who promised them to pay them, who promised them troops to help them go to the Holy Land, pay them. Well, he never did. And so the Crusaders, in a rage, and this is a, a, illust a medieval illustration, actually were the first people ever to successfully conquer Constantinople, something the... Um, Something the the Muslims were never able to do until 1453. Vikings tried it. No one was ever able to take Constantinople except these crusaders. So I guess you could say this crusade was a success, but they did not conquer anything in the Holy Land. They conquered um, uh, Constantinople, which horrified Pope Innocent III. But 
one of his men said these legates who was in charge who was representing the pope said it was okay for them to do this so he tried to make the best of a very bad situation and this was established the latin empire of the east and if you remember the hagia sophia that beautiful church that justinian built the the crusaders stripped the silver iconostasis and took many great artifacts and, and took them back to Venice. Some of the most beautiful artifacts from the city of Constantinople can be found in the city of Venice. And this forever embittered the Greek Christian world to the Latin Christian world. And Pope John Paul II um, in the year 2000 um, apologized to the Greeks for the sack of Constantinople. Um, for that the, the, the Christians what they what they did in Constantinople. So the fourth crusade was both a disaster and a successful crusade, but they never reached the Holy Land. And then this will show you what it looked like. There's the Latin Empire right here, right? The Empire of Nicaea, what's left of the of the Byzantine world. They do eventually regain this whole territory, but the Byzantine Empire is vastly weakened by this event. All right, um, and you can see the uh, the, the the kingdoms of the of the uh, the uh, Crusaders are getting smaller and smaller. They're owning a smaller and smaller slice of territory by this time. Now the later Crusades. This will be it for us, right? There were three further major Crusades in the 1200s. The Fifth Crusade that was a military disaster that ended in Egypt. Um, that was from 1217 to 1221. The 6th and 7th Crusades were led by St. Louis IX of France, a true saint, um, who died in 1270 um, in Tunisia going on his last crusade. Um, and these two likewise were unsuccessful. And then finally, the Crusader states dwindled and dwindled until the last Christian stronghold in the Holy Land, a city called Acre, fell in 1291. And this was the end of the Crusader states. Um, it was a remarkable period in history, guys. Um, I can't defend those actions, but a lot of people will tell you that, um, that oh, this is the reason the Crusades are the reasons the Muslims hate us today, Islam hates us today. And that is just simply not the case. Uh, for, the, for Islam, for the, for the Muslims, uh, historically speaking, this was a very minor skirmish in their vast lands and their vast territories. Um, they didn't even really have, uh, the, few of their Muslim historians even mentioned the Crusades. They don't even call them the Crusades. Um, it was only in the 19th century when Europeans began to enter the, the, the Middle East that the, they even learned about the extent of the Crusades. It really wasn't a major part of their history. So this is not the reason the Muslims hated Crusades. Yes, there were atrocities, particularly against Jewish people um, caused in the Crusades. But again, that was never an official act. The church always condemned the, um, the atrocities that were committed against the Jewish people. So, um, there are a lot of myths, a lot of things I tried to answer in this uh, lecture. Um, it's a it's a vast material. By the way, that's a statue of Saint Louis the Ninth. That's in this on this particular slide. So it's a lot of material, guys. But remember, the first eight or you know, all those maps. The the first slide you really got to get serious on is the slide uh, about the. Um, the, the uh, eve of the Crusades. That's when we're really covering some new material. All that other material was review. So thank you for listening.